workers in our own backyard here in Minot. So please give them a good Minot State welcome. Icy Gaze. Hello. Hello. So um, like she said, uh, I'm Rob. I'm Eric. And um, we are contemporary art collectors that live here in Minot. And we really appreciate Professor, Professor Olson giving us this opportunity just to share a bit about what's happened in our lives over the past five years. And then we thought we'd give a little bit of insight that we've gained um, in our time as collectors about the art world that we've kind of seen, and then um, take a little time for questions. Um, so just to start out, um, a little background on us. So like I said, I'm Rob. I'm an ear, nose, and throat surgeon at, the hos at Trinity Hospital here in Minot. And I grew up in Alabama. Um, and so um, I was in a fairly conservative household. You know, we would go to museums and see art, but I wouldn't say that art was like a real huge part of my upbringing. I remember that there was this beautiful portrait of my mom that was hanging in our home that was kind of a special thing. There was also like this beautiful uh, ceramic vase of flowers that was always sitting in the middle of the table. So that was kind of like a treasured art object that we had. Um, but my, my family wasn't really a collecting family, so that's kind of me. And so I'm Eric, and I am actually from Richmond, Virginia, which is a little bit more of an art hub. Um, when I was growing up, my mom did do some collecting from just like local galleries in the, like Virginia, North Carolina area. Um, more interesting, my dad was a contractor, and we always worked really closely with the architect to design all the houses that I grew up in. And I grew up in this really cool, 70s contemporary house on a lake and it had like stained glass panels that we had artists commission and so art was important for us we went to the virginia museum a lot that has a really fantastic modern art collection but you know we weren't like collecting in new york city or anything like that it was all just a very local regional kind of existence yeah but and so Eric and I uh, actually met at the University of Florida where I was doing my ear, nose, and throat residency and he was working on his PhD. And we ended up moving to Minot, to North Dakota for my job. And I would say that art was a bit of a part of our lives. We would, we, we basically collected what we like to call like thrift store <laughs> art. So we would go to these thrift stores and try to find, you know, diamonds secret, in the rough. Yeah, yeah exactly. But that was kind of the extent of our collection. And so, um, but I think we would say that when all of this kind of started was around October 2013. So we decided to get married, yay! yay. Um, but we couldn't get <laughs> we couldn't get married here in North Dakota, boo, boo um, because Obergefell hadn't happened yet. And so we ended up deciding to go to California to get married. And we wanted to get married in San Francisco, but it turns out if you want to get married in San Francisco, you have to wait like a couple months. So we ended up getting married in Oakland. Oakland um, Courthouse. Yeah, at the Oakland Courthouse. And then we went um, to brunch later on that trip. We spent, uh, you know, a couple days in San Francisco. We went to brunch, and then afterwards we went to an arts in the park. And there was this uh, wonderful uh, painter there, and we bought one of her paintings to kind of celebrate the trip. And then we said, we want to do something artistic while we're here in, in um, San Francisco. What do we do? Um, and she said, um, You should go see the David Hockney exhibit at the De Young Museum. And so, like, full disclosure, we had no idea who David Hockney was. No. We were like, we didn't even know the De Young Museum was a museum in San Francisco. It's in Golden Gate Park. Um, so we made the pilgrimage out there to see what ended up being a really life-changing show for us. 100%. So yeah, the, the De Young is a contemporary art museum in Golden Gate Park. This is a beautiful picture of it. And inside the De Young was the show, a bigger exhibition by David Hockney. And this was a retrospective of his work. And um, so I had, I mean, I, I feel like when you start getting into art, you kind of have this perception that you're supposed to like certain things like the Mona Lisa, Starry Night, this kind of thing, right? And you feel like if you don't, then there's like something wrong with you or whatever. And so, but I feel, but at the same time, you kind of interact with some of these famous pieces of art and you might not feel much of anything. And I really feel like this show was a moment when I, when art really touched me personally, you know, that there's, uh, Hockney's art is so queer and it's so figurative and it's so colorful, really, that it was something that I really responded to. And there were these giant, you know, two stories tall paintings everywhere. It was really fantastic. You could watch him like live paint those on his iPad. He would record all the drawings and they were being broadcast 
kind of stand in the middle of the room and see these paintings unfold around you. Yeah, and I think it was really eye-opening for us because I think traditionally when we thought contemporary art, we kind of um, thought like piles of trash <laughs> and uh, just really inaccessible, cold. Process like, art, yeah. a pile of candy in the, um, in the corner, right? You know, this kind of thing, which now we've learned can be exciting and be interesting, but initially it feels a bit cold, a bit Contemporary art sterile. is a much bigger world than we thought it was when we first started. 100%. Yeah. And I think this show kind of opened our eyes to the fact of what, what art could be and how you could feel when you interact with it. And so I think we, at that point, we started kind of exploring more about, you know, what's, what, uh, seeing more museum shows, go, l reading about art online, that kind of thing. And so then um, Toshin, which is a, a publishing company, released this book called the David Hockney Sumo Edition. And it's 66 pounds, and it's enormous. It, it like comes with its own tripod. It is literally, well, I don't know the exact dimensions, but I think it's like 40 inches by yeah, 24 inches. Yeah, it's crazy. And so, and if you paid $5,000 for this book, you got a print, one of a thousand, of David Hockney's iPad, iPad drawings. prints. And I said, honey, how amazing would it be to get this book and then we'll get a print too and it'll commemorate our wonderful trip to San Francisco. And spoiler alert, I already bought it. <laughs> and, and, and Eric said, or. Yeah, or instead of buying a book that I'm really not sure what we're gonna do with, yeah. what if we took that money and bought a piece of original contemporary art? Right, so. and I said, well, I don't even know what, how to even go about that, but I said, let's look online. And so I searched online and we saw that Artnet had an article, the top 10 emerging artists of October 2016. Um, and one of them was uh, an artist named Cordon Kawasaj, and there was a painting called Stairs Number Three. Um, and we really fell in love with this painting. We loved kind of the, uh, you know, op art aspect of it. The co it was very colorful. Boy, yeah. Uh, kind of organic with these blades of grass. Or like something that. else kind of yeah. creeping <laughs> into the painting. So there's this weirdness. So I reached out to the gallery and I said, hey, I'm sure this is sold, but we really love this painting by Cord. And they said, actually, it isn't sold. <laughs> And it's five thousand dollars, and uh, and so we said, okay, this is fate. This we should do this. And so I I returned the book. Um, <laughs> luckily, it hadn't shipped, and um, and we bought this painting by Corden, and um, and we shipped it to North Dakota. And I will never forget the day that we uncreated this painting, and we're looking at it, and it just was so special to be like, this is the only one of these that exists in the world. And we were able to support this emerging artist uh, in her career and also support a gallery that's kind of a smaller gallery. And we did that all from North Dakota. And it was really special. Yeah. Um I think, you know, at, at that point we said, well, where do we go from here? You know, this is something that we, we really love and we're really excited about, but we didn't even know what to do. So we actually reached out to Corridan. And yeah, decided to like ask her for some advice because, yeah. you know, being here in Minot, how do you get involved with the an art, art world, world that right. tends to be on the coasts? Yeah. yeah. And so she said, hey, if you're interested in New York art, you should come to New York during one of the art fairs and check it out. Um, and so. I don't think we even knew like what art fairs were at the time. Right, was, exactly. And so we set up a visit and we went and did a studio visit with Corden, um, which was amazing. We were able to see her studio and uh, there were all these works in progress everywhere. And we, you know, it's very exciting for those of you that Bronx, aren't painters. The train from oh yeah, we went to the Bronx. Yeah, that was an adventure. Was, was um, and, and so we went up there and visited and it was just a wonderful experience talking about her history, um, what she's doing in contemporary art. And then from there we went to the Freeze Art Fair. And the Freeze Art Fair is this huge art fair on Randall Island in Manhattan. It's this giant white tent just filled with like endless art. And it was very overwhelming. Yeah, um, like a different level of art than I think we even expected at the fair because these are like, you know, there might have been a David Hockney painting there, right, like yeah. that you could buy. So, um, I mean, I think we're walking around. We actually paid for a VIP tour like a couple days into the fair. We found out later that like the VIP of the fairs happened before the fairs open, and if you're actually VIP, you don't pay. Yeah. <laughs> but anyway, we didn't know that at the time, and we paid, and it was lovely. We had a great time, and they showed us this art. But we were walking around the fair and just seeing, kind of just exposing ourselves to all of this art, and it was overwhelming and crazy. But I did. This is actually a photo that I took of a painting that we loved and we didn't know 
who this was. John Wesley. We later found out that the artist is John Wesley, and he's a fabulous figurative, painting that, figurative painter that unfortunately just passed away. Um, but he works with a gallery that we now work with as well in New York City. And I just thought it was really special to kind of see this and say, oh my goodness, I love this. I'm responding to this. And I just took this picture randomly, and now it's kind of been um, something that was a little prescient, I guess. Yeah. Um, and so from the fair, we then read that the Whitney Biennial was going on. And the Whitney Biennial, for, for those of you that aren't familiar, is a show that's put on every two years by the Whitney Museum of American Art. Um, and it kind of celebrates what's new in contemporary American art. And this particular one was put on by uh, the curators, uh, Chris Liu and Mia Locke. And, um, and we, I think it was really a formative experience of what contemporary art could be. Yeah, definitely. I mean, it was um, much broader than we thought. It involved a lot of new technology um, and a lot of social commentary. And the art was... I mean, it was really like nothing we've ever seen before. It was figurative, but also like kind of, some of it was ra rather shocking. Yeah, and for sure. And I think, you know, basically it showed us again what contemporary art could be. There was queer art. This is an installation by Raul de Nieves who makes these like beaded queer uh, sculpture celebrating like craft and that kind of thing. There is an artist named Celeste Puy Spencer who uh, does these paintings of kind of horrifying paintings of middle America that are very political. Um, and are fascinating. Um, I'd never seen art quite kind that was that political. Um, there were figurative painters. Dana Schutz was in this show. Um, it was actually very controversial. She painted Emmett Till in his casket, and there was kind of a whole controversy surrounding that painting. You can read about that online. Um, we also exposed, were exposed to the artist Tala Madani. Um, who, I don't know if any of you are familiar with her work, but I would just say Google Tala Madani, Google image search Tala Madani, and it will be an interesting experience for you. So I, I love her work. For I think it's great. It's rather unique. Yes. Yeah. Um, so we, we saw her paintings. And then Eric mentioned technological. Jordan Wolfson had an exhibit, which was a VR installation. And you basically put on this like headset and you, there was like someone getting beaten to death. It was horrifying. And you could either choose to like look at it and kind of engage with what was happening, or you could look away and it was kind of pretty and happy. And it was all very overwhelming and horrifying, which is, I think, what Jordan does all the time, very effectively. Um, but again, it would just kind of, it, it allowed us to realize what the breadth of contemporary art could be. And I think at that point we said, we're really excited about yeah, this. We're going to lean in and Maybe buy some more pieces. Yeah, exactly. And so um, in February of 2018, we asked Corden about what she was interested in. And she uh, introduced us to the artist Gahi Park, who was her friend. And Gahi was having a show at Motel Gallery in Brooklyn. And, um, and they said, we reached out. And, and Rosie at the gallery said, well, all the paintings are sold except for one. Um, and it's called Kissing in the Tree. It was the title painting for the show, like the centerpiece of the show. So yeah. It was exciting. And it was 85 by 76 inches. And honestly, at that point, I didn't really have a good feel for like size of paintings, but that's a really big painting. <laughs> uh, and um, so we bought it. Uh, I also uh, had not thought about the logistics of getting it no, back to my notch. Not at all. But what we said was, we looked at this painting and we said, it's fascinating. You know, there was this element of kind of sexuality. There was an element of voyeurism. There was some humor, some surreal uh, nature to the painting. And, and I like think- this fragmented yeah. image that was like kind of- Temporality, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, exactly. And so I think we really responded to the imagery and the painting, even though we weren't able to see it in person. And so we decided to buy that work. And then Eric had been looking online. And I found this painting by Sophie Laramore, which is a second painting, the dogs. And it was just like, so I had like this kind of Memphis style, I felt like, and the palette it really kind of like evoked memories of my childhood, but also the subject was interesting and the technique is like, you really have to see it in person. She uses this Rolotex paint, and she has a very like pointillist style. So it's a really kind of bold, shocking painting. And it was either, at this point, it was like one or the other. We couldn't really yeah. like buy two paintings. No. But we decided we loved them both so much, we were just going to stretch and make Do it, it happen. So. so we bought that and another painting by Corridan, and we had them delivered to um, to Minot. to Minot. Rosie and was so nice, created everything. Yes, for us and, uh, and we spent the whole day hanging Gahi's painting <laughs> on the wall. And to our credit, it is still hanging there <laughs> and it's, it's doing off. well. So we have smart handler skills here. Yeah. 
Um, but I think, again, we, uh, the, these two paintings, we really started to see the collection kind of growing and expanding, and we were excited to learn more. So we, and a big part of our story was kind of New York at that point. So we went back to New York again to kind of uh, see, you know, explore more ideas of art. And at that point, I had read a review of a show at the Whitney Museum again um, uh, called History Keeps Me Awake at Night by the artist David Wanyarovich. And I wasn't familiar with his work at all, um, but Roberta Smith, the chief critic of the New York Times, had given it a rave review and said, if you're in New York, you have to see this show. And I was like, well, there's this queer artist who died of AIDS, um, but they're doing a retrospective at the Whitney and we should go. Um, and so we went and I think it's interesting because I feel like David's art, if you look at the art that's in our collection, doesn't necessarily go one to one, no. but at the same time he was exploring these fascinating ideas of, um, you know, kind of the anger and uh, activism and, and really makes you feel what he was feeling at the time about how the world was treating people with HIV and with AIDS. And I think does it in a very effective way through street art, through fine art, through all of these mediums. And we were, I, I think it was really affecting as we walked through the show because I'm, you know, as being a younger person, I didn't really experience this firsthand, but through David's art, I could feel what he was feeling, and it was really special and, re and, and really moved me. And then at the end of the show, they had this piece, which is called One Day This Kid, and it's this beautiful picture of David as a little kid. I'm going to start crying. Um, and it's the text that surrounds him is all about all the horrible things that are going to happen to him because he's gay. And, uh, you know, as a, cl a closeted guy growing up in Alabama, you know, I felt like there was just something so special about this, and it really touched me deeply uh, um, based on my experience that I was bringing to the show. And so we looked at the, the, the information about the show, and we saw that David was represented by this gallery, PPOW. Um, and we didn't know yeah. anything about them. I mean the thought of like going to art galleries was still very foreign to us. There was um, kind of just idea of uh, inaccessibility and intimidation about going to like these big city exactly. art galleries. But I said, I don't care. This was the go. best show I've ever seen in my life. We have to go say hi and meet these people. And so uh, the Whitney's in Chelsea and we w and so is PPOW. It was, they moved to Tribeca. But um, we went, we walked over to PPOW and we said, hi, you don't know us. We're Robin <laughs> Eric and we're from North Dakota. But we just saw the David Wanyarovich show at the Whitney and it was one of the most special things that we've seen. And we just wanted to say thank you for putting this on and, and wanted to say say hi. And, um, and we met Penny and Wendy and kind of formed a, a, a relationship with them. And I think, um, it, for those of you that don't know, PPOW is a pioneering gallery that was founded by Penny Pilkington, the PP, and then Wendy Ossoff, the WO. Um, and they founded it back in 1983 in the Lower East Side, um, and they were it was showing. Like, I guess such a sketchy part of town. Then their cab driver wouldn't even take them to their gallery. They yeah. would like drop them off a few blocks away. Yeah, and they had to walk. Yeah. And so, um, but they they started this really special program that was focusing on queer artists figurative artists, these kind of things. And I'll tell you that like back when they started the gallery, that was not how you got a successful mm -hmm. gallery. That was not who you showed to be successful. And they said, we don't care. This is something special. This is something we're passionate about. And they started this gallery and they, they represent David's estate. And so um, we connected with them. And on that same trip, there was another art fair called Armory. Um, and that's uh, a really cool art fair that's in New York on the piers, and um, PPOW had a booth there, and they were showing David's work, and we said, well, we should go say hi and um, see David's work and see what's going on, and so we went, and they opened up kind of the back room to the booth, and we saw this drawing. Which is Robin F. Williams. It's um, called Joggers. Robin is a fantastic painter, but her drawings are also really great because her paintings are a little more finessed, but yeah. her drawings, you can really see a lot of, um, I guess, the emotion and movement and stuff when she's creating the studies. Totally. And we had kind of been looking at her work online, and we were really struck by this kind of this statuesque, you can't see the whole thing here, but there's the statuesque figures that are jogging, 
and the woman's kind of in front, and the man's like got this expression like he's trying to catch up with her, and like there's some there's a lot of movement in the painting of different parts of their bodies, which is incorporates a bit of humor too into the drawing, and I think it really was something that we got really excited about. So we ended up we ended up buying it from from PPOW at the fair, which was fantastic, and then um, we kept exploring the fair, and we saw another artist, the artist on the left here, named Anthony Iacono. He's a queer artist that's represented by Marinero Gallery in New York City, and he does these fabulous collage paintings. So basically, he paints like um, paints gradients canvas. on canvas and then cuts them out and creates a collage of like kind of queer imagery, fetish culture, this kind of thing. And um, all the works of the show were sold, but we went over to the gallery and they had some much larger works down in the basement. The basement. <laughs> yeah. So, they pull out this painting, which is like five feet by three feet. It was pretty enormous. Yeah. And, and we bought it. Yeah. And, um, and so I think w at that point, we really started to get a little bit more excited about um, kind of incorporating these, this aspect of queer artists, queer culture into the art that we were looking at. And we discovered Anthony through Marinero. We discovered the artist Kyle Dunn. We'd been following along with him, but he actually signed on to PPOW, the gallery that we were talking about before. And um, we bought the work here, um, uh, this uh, is from PPOW. And then another artist, Michael Stam, was from the gallery Shulamet Nazarian in Los Angeles. And then Chris Boja is another artist um, who we discovered through Mrs. Gallery, which is in Maysmith, Queens. But what was really cool was all of these artists are kind of exploring queer art, queer culture through different mediums, sculpture, painting, this kind of thing. But then also every single gallery on this list is actually female run. So uh, Marinero, uh, PPOW, Shulamet Nazarian, and Mrs. are all female run galleries. And I think it's really fantastic as a collector to be able to support not only queer artists, feminist artists, but also female run galleries, smaller galleries, not just the big names um, in the art world. And so, um, so we started looking at what we were collecting and we began to realize that there was this kind of like surreal vibe. Um, this is- oh, Themes were emerging. Themes yeah. were emerging, yes. <laughs> And this is a painting by the artist um, Alexander Harrison. Alexander Harrison, and he's an African American artist that grew up in South Carolina. And he paints these fabulously kind of surreal images where he deals with kind of racist iconography, uh, this, this kind of grotesque watermelon that's basically like blocking your view of this kind of idyllic scene mm -hmm. in the background. There was also bed sheets in this work, and this we bought from. Um, uh, show at NADA in Miami, um, and um, it's just a really powerful work using surrealism to kind of explore this history of uh, in, in, in America that we uh, deal with every day. Um, another uh, thing that emerged was a concept of f a kind of feminist art. This is a sculpture by the artist Julie Curtis, um, who is um, generally known for her paintings, but she does these when she paints, it kind of looks like hair. Yeah. And then she also does these sculptures out of hair. Yeah. So. And so we, um, we, Eric bought me this for my birthday, mm -hmm. but there was kind of this feminist vibe. And then there's also this queer vibe. I mentioned the artist Michael Stamm, and this is one of his works that's in our collection called Submission. And he deals with kind of power dynamics in queer culture um, and fetishism mm -hmm. and, and this kind of thing. Um, and so, like I said, as we looked at it, we said there's a surreal feminist queer vibe. The things that we're collecting and bringing to North Dakota, like it was really cool to just walk around our house and see the dialogue between the different artists. And like, we didn't even know that it would happen, but when we put things together, it was just this really special pairing. I, I started to realize what people were talking about when they talked about curation and dialogue mm -hmm. and all this stuff that I'd never heard of before, right? And so I said, this is really cool, but um, it's a bit too bad that like we're living in North Dakota and like n literally nobody's gonna come to our house and see this stuff. And so we're so excited about what these artists are doing. You know, Alexander exploring African-American, his, the history of uh, this and, and, um, and then, you know, this, these feminist artists, these queer artists. How amazing would it be to share this it, um, with the, the world, the world yeah. yeah, and we decided to do that through Instagram. So you know, traditionally, contemporary collectors are kind of uh, guarded, Secretive, yeah, yeah about what they share. Um, and so we kind of decided, as a couple, to commit to just sharing these artists and saying, "Hey, look at this amazing painter! Look at what they're doing! Look at this amazing sculptor!" 
check this out, you know? And we started sharing our collection online, and we went with the handle The Icy Gaze, um, which um, I will take full credit for. Um, so um, we, we thought, well, we're gay, and we live in North Dakota, so we're cold, and we like to look at judgy. things and judge them. So, and let me tell you, the, uh, the art world loves a pun, and, um, and people kind of responded to that. And um, we started connecting with other gallerists. Um, with other collectors, other, yeah. and yeah, just more artists, and seeing a lot of art. That, I mean, I think up until Instagram, really, a lot of um, art was mediated through the gallery system. Yeah. So if you are an artist and you're creating work, you know, how do you get it out there? How do you show it? And the internet's really been so great for that, for allowing artists to disseminate what they're making, for us to see it before the gallerists decide that it's important and start showing it. So. Yeah, I, there's been a democratization a bit in the art world through Instagram, and I think we were excited to be a bit of a part of that. And, um, and so we started sharing and connecting, and one of the artists that we discovered through this was an artist named Salman Tor. Um, and he's a, a queer painter, um, and we had seen his work and were excited about it, and Eric said, you know, we should reach out and do a studio visit with this guy. He's like, paintings are phenomenal. And I really think Rob special. thought he's not going to say yes because yeah. his career was kind of taking off. So he but. wasn't represented by our gallery yet, but we reached out over Instagram and just said, hi, we love your work. We would love to do a studio visit. And he said, I'm familiar with your Instagram mm -hmm. and I'd love for you to come and visit. Um, and so we went back to New York, uh, to Brooklyn, mm -hmm. and, um, and did a studio visit with Salman back in September of 2019. And I think this was really one of the most special things that's happened during our kind of collecting journey. Um, Salman had basically painted a lot of paintings, mm -hmm. um, and they were all hanging in his studio. And we just sat down and started having a conversation about our experiences growing up you know, kind of closeted and queer. Well, I grew up closeted and queer in Alabama. And Salman um, grew up in Pakistan, so obviously very, you know, just not these a very cult in the area. Exactly. Like, and Eric was in Richmond. Mm -hmm. And I feel like, you know, it, we, while our backgrounds are not the same at all, we had this shared experience of kind of being in a community that wasn't as accepting. And Salman, what he does in his paintings is he creates these imagined scenes of like queer bliss or queer celebration. And he doesn't paint from photographs or anything. He just imagines them and then paints these like luscious, gorgeous paintings of like queer brown bodies, like, you know, in postcoital bliss or whatever. And it's really special. And we were just sitting there like crying in his studio, like how, and, I, and it really opened our eyes, I think, to this how the language of art can articulate some of these emotions that you know you might not be able to say or you might not even realize that you have. And um, we just had that experience with Salman in his studio. Um, and he, you know, he said, I would love for you to get a Pete, one of my works. And he connected us um, with Peter at Nature Mort in New Delhi, where he had a show coming up. So And this is the piece here that we um, that we bought from the show. And it's the first one of the first things that you see when you come into our house, kind of welcomes you into the space. And it's just this fantastic, beautiful, serene portrait of this person. And uh, I cut it out of the, the painting, unfortunately, but there's a bottle of poppers that's sitting on the windowsill that's like <laughs> integral to the painting. So you can Google that if you want. But anyway, it really changes the whole dynamic of the painting. And it's not up here. So, um, But it was just really special to connect with Salman and, um, and, 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 and have that moment with him. And he said, I have a museum show coming up, but I can't give you any specifics because it's not all buttoned down yet. And we we went on to find that the museum was the Whitney, in, yeah. uh, again, uh, in, in, in Manhattan. And he had a solo show there in November of 2020. Um, and it actually got a fantastic review by Roberta Smith in the and New York Times. Pretty much all the paintings that were in his studio when we were there were ended up being in the Whitney in show. In that show. So it was just a really experience, a fabulous experience for us, connecting with someone on such a wonderful level through art, you know? Mm -hmm. and. Um, and so then it kind of turned into a little bit of an obsession. <laughs> um, so uh, this is a painting by the artist Anna Wyant. Um, she's a young painter that had a show. Um, well, she, she hadn't had a show at all. And we actually connected through Instagram yeah, with through another art collector that yeah. told us we might appreciate her work. Yeah, he said, I've seen what you've shared, and this might be something that you'd be interested in. And so he connected us with the gallerist um, Ellie Rines at the gallery 56 Henry. 
Um, and uh, she sent us a PDF of this painting, and Eric like calls me. The minute he opens the, the PDF, he's like, have you looked at this painting? And I'm like, no. So I pull it up, and I'm like, well, we have to buy it, mm, right? I've never seen anything like Ever. this. It's and so, so this painting, by the way, is four feet tall and seven feet wide. And, on um, panel. Yeah, yes. and we ended up buying it on the spot. And uh, Ellie said, hey, we're going to have a show of Anna in New York. You should come and we'll hang out and you can see the show and, and meet Anna. And we said, sure. So we went to New York and went to her opening. And it was our very first kind of gallery dinner. We went to this uh, a restaurant in, in, Chinatown. in Chinatown and just uh, had a fantastic evening meeting Anna. Her mom was there, um, a bunch of other collectors that were there. And we just had the most fabulous evening of like food and conversation about art, about collecting, about our story, living in North Dakota, you know, buying queer art They're in North from Dakota. Canada. So yeah, we exactly. a judge up in Toronto, I think. So. Yeah. And so it was just really amazing. And we said, hey, you know, I think this is something that we want to really lean into. Mm -hmm. And I think we, at that point, we really began to collect in earnest. And, um, and so then, um, I think this was a moment, this is a sculpture by the artist Sarah Peters called Floating Head. And it's a bronze head that we bought and it was in a show in Seoul, South Korea. Mm -hmm. And so we were kind of trying to figure out how to get this bronze head from Seoul to North Dakota. And I think it was at that moment that we realized, like, are, are we, like, art collectors? <laughs> like, I think we might be. Like, and I think, I feel like, you know, I was initially super resistant to, like, using that term and saying, I'm an art collector, you know? Like, but... Yeah, I think um, we have, like, a conception of, like, what art collectors were. And it was, like, Peggy Guggenheim or yeah. someone you know, with a lot of money that can have like this fabulous lifestyle and create a museum like. Yeah, and has really... like 1800 pieces and is mm -hmm. donated into the MoMA, that kind of thing. And I think what we realized was that that wasn't true. It was just people who are excited about art that want to celebrate it and support artists that are doing, that you think are doing something special. And I think I realized that, you know, that term can be a negative, but it can be a positive too. You know, we could use this wonderful experience that we'd had together to share with other people and support them and say, oh my God, that's amazing. We want to help you show that to as many people as possible. And if that makes us a collector, then yeah, amazing. I think, you I'm know, into if you're it. creating art and putting it out there, it takes a lot of courage and it's great to have people come and support you and yeah. you know, say, we really appreciate what you're doing and we want you to do more of it. Yeah, so. and so we did. We collected a lot and we have over 100 pieces in our collection now, all hanging in our home right down the street. <laughs> um, but um, as we continued to collect more and more and kind of living with this art, we realized that like, um, there was more to it than just um, you know, buying paintings and buying sculpture. And I think it was really exciting to discover how um, we could be more than just hoarders. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, I think that um, there, it, it, we had this passion for supporting these female identifying artists, these queer artists, these female run galleries, but at the same time, we realized that we could do more by supporting institutions. And um, obviously, as you're aware through this talk, the Whitney Museum has played a huge role in kind of opening our eyes to what contemporary art could be. And we joined what's called the Artist Council there, which is a group of young collectors that go to gallery openings and do studio visits. Yeah, and, and organize artist talks for us. And, and a lot of it's online, which mm -hmm. is great. So we're able to participate here from North Dakota. Um, and so we started doing that. And then even more exciting, we're actually sponsoring the biennial this year. Um, and so that's happening at the end of this month. Yeah. Um, and so it kind of came full circle. This was such a formative aspect to our collecting journey. And now to be able to support that as collectors is really, really special. Um, and then we joined the board of FIRE, the which is... FIRE Island Artist Residency. It's the only queer artist residency, I think, in the world. Yeah, one of, uh, it was definitely yeah. the first. Yeah. Um, and it was started by Chris Boja, one of the artists that I mentioned before, who is a queer artist working with Mrs. Gallery. And we ended up joining the board of FIRE and kind of helping them celebrate. Basically, they bring about six to eight queer artists every year out to FIRE Island, and they spend a couple... They rent like a few houses and make like a little art compound for the summer. For the summer and just let people experiment and make queer art and celebrate and it's really fantastic. So check it out if you haven't ever looked at that. But, um, but so we joined the Board of Fire and then we also started working locally um, with our museum here in Minot, the Tabe. 
um, which is a, has a fantastic program. Um, we have a wonderful director, Rachel, and she's doing really special things um, here in Minot. And um, and so we have been back Saturday night is yes, Soup It Up, a fundraiser yes. at the Talby. So. so tomorrow night there's a, a called Soup It Up. It's a fundraiser to raise money for the museum. But there's um, you pay twenty dollars and you can come. And there's a show right now of art from members that is up, which is fabulous. Um, and it's just a great way to celebrate and support the local museum. So we'd love to see everyone there. Right. <laughs> uh, but it's just been really beer great. Beer from Atypical. Right. Oh, yeah. Free, free, well, free beer from Atypical yeah. if you buy a ticket. Yeah. But, uh, but no, it'll be great. And I think just celebrating art here in Minot as well. That's why we're here talking about this too, um, bringing it home here. And uh, it's just been a really great experience for us. Um, and then moving on to new adventures. Um, this is really exciting, but we, you know, we've been sharing our art online, but um, in really exciting news, we're now able to be able to share it in person. Yeah, we've been asked to curate a show for a little gallery by a friend of ours, Eric Rushman in Chicago. And so we're doing our first curatorial venture. We have a lot of artists that are in our collection, a lot of other artists that we admire that kind of fit into this show of kind of between the line of abstraction and figuration. And this show is going to open to coincide with Expo Chicago, which is a big art fair that's in Chicago. Yeah, in April. So, yeah. And one of the centerpiece works of the show is by an artist that you may all be familiar with. Yeah. Her name is Corden Kawasage, <laughs> and she's the first artist that we ever collected. So I think it's just really exciting to be able to show and celebrate Corden's work in Chicago, uh, and it kind of brings it all full circle. So it's just been a really exciting, fun journey that we've had you know, celebrating these galleries, these artists, and um, we really appreciate Linda giving us the opportunity to kind of share it. And so obviously throughout this, we've kind of been interacting with the art world, right? And, um, and I feel like we've gained a little bit of insight into how to um, kind of uh, participate, I guess, in the art world. And we just wanted to give a couple insights that we've kind of learned over the last couple of years. That was from Ryan Driscoll. Oh. Uh, yeah, Just another queer of, artist who's yeah. fabulous. He's with the Gallery Soft opening in London, and his art is amazing. Mm -hmm. um, Ryan Driscoll on Instagram. Um, but I think the first thing that we would say is be honest in your art. So I, I feel like, you know, I don't know how familiar you are with like contemporary art right now, but there's this movement towards figuration and um, kind of these colorful paintings. And I would say that, you know, I would tell any artist, don't just jump on the bandwagon. You want to make something that is honest. It, you make something that you're, you feel something. It yeah. makes you happy. It makes you sad. It turns you on, whatever. Like, be honest. And if figurative painting makes you, makes you feel something, then do it. But maybe not. Maybe it's a video installation of butterflies, like surrounded by stone eggs on memory foam mattresses. And if that's what you want to do, well, don't do that because Virginia Lee Montgomery already did it. So, but but if it's if that gives you life, then do that. You know, celebrate what you feel. And I think if there's honesty in your work, you know, we'll, as collectors, we'll feel that and we'll get excited about it. And maybe we'll discover something that we didn't know we loved. Um, and I, 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 that's how I feel about that. Um, and then I think another thing is if you're looking to have a career, collecting uh, or connecting with reputable galleries is huge. Um, a great opportunity is Instagram. Obviously, we're big fans. Um, but um, you know, it can connect you. It's a great tool to kind of showcase your work and allow discovery of your art without like sending an unsolicited email to a gallery, which they usually don't particularly appreciate. And so it, they can discover you online through Instagram. But I think another amazing source is something called NADA, which is the New um, Art Dealers Alliance, which is a fabulous organization. I have the website up here. But it's a nonprofit that's dedicated uh, to cultivating, supporting, and advancing uh, new voices in contemporary art. And they have galleries all over the world, actually, but galleries in Minneapolis and Chicago, not just in New York, not just in LA. And I think the, um, those galleries are going to be reputable. They pay their artists. They work with um, uh, collectors that care. You know? They're very and, passionate about just like the art, not just the sale of the art. Exactly. So, so uh, I think if you want to get with a good gallery, NADA is a great place to start. Um, and then um, I think another thing that we'd say is uh, be hungry, but don't be thirsty. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, I think if you want to make a career of selling your art, it's not an easy thing to do, I feel like. And so I think having a plan is totally uh, a great idea to do. Um, but I think what we would say one way to connect is 
get a professional website so that collectors like us can visit and just see your CV, see your work, you know, engage with it um, on a simple level. Um, and then also gallerists can do that too. If they see something that they like, they can check it out, they can Google you and you show up. You know, I think that there's nothing wrong with that. Um, you know, being present and active on Instagram mm -hmm. is a great way to engage with people like us. You know, people just DM us and say, hey, I make art that I think you might like, check it out. And we do, mm -hmm. um, you know, so I think that's a fabulous way to connect with people. And, it, and again, it's a way to do it um, like instead of just bringing your portfolio to some gallery opening and trying to show it to them, that's not how to do it, don't do that. But I mean, I think that, you know, being, being present and then being present in real life too, going to openings, going to openings here in Minot, going to Minneapolis, you know, going to the Walker, whatever, you know, just being out there and engaging with the world yeah. and making. It'll organically happen. Yes. You don't want to like try to force it to happen. Exactly. I, you build these relationships. You'll make these friendships, and it'll. And uh, honestly, it could turn into something really special. Um, you know. And so the other thing that we would say is, you know, give it time. Um, obviously, the success doesn't come for most people overnight. And you know, there are trends in the art world, and what you're doing may not be something that everybody is all that excited about right now. But give it five years, and maybe they all will be. You know. And so I think it's easy. I feel like sometimes I see artists that are kind of frustrated or disappointed mm -hmm. that they're trying not. To, yeah, replicate what's working for somebody else. Yeah, mm -hmm. and I think just make the work, share it, be open and honest, and hopefully you'll be able to collect with, uh, connect with other um, collectors, gallerists, other artists that are doing something special, and, and then you can all celebrate it together just like we've done you know, over the past five years. And like I said, I really appreciate um, you giving us the opportunity uh, to, to give this talk. We really thank the MSU Art Department, um, the Northwest Art Center, Linda and Greg, for just allowing us to share our story. And hopefully um, what we've shared gives you um, some, some insight yeah. into our lives and also into the art world in general. Um, but we're super excited to answer any questions that you might have about, um, about our journey, mm -hmm. yeah, or anything. <laughs> Yes. Uh, could you guys, um, do you guys get um, commissioned to do critiques for queer art? Like? Well, I, we would love to. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we haven't. So, no, we haven't. I mean, I think I would say that, like, you know, for me, we don't have, I don't have a background in art. You know, I'm a biochemistry major, right? So I'm like a scientist, like very one plus one equals two. And Eric's like, or does it? And I'm like, no, it does. <laughs> I'm, a, but I'm a political uh, philosopher. Yeah. So, <laughs> so, you know, I think initially I felt a little um, re reticent to do that because I was like, well, what do we know? You know, mm -hmm. like, and I think what's been great over the last like five years, we have tried to educate ourselves. You know, I read, Goodness, I read both volumes of art since 1900. Um, I was trying to like figure out what was going on and like constantly asking Eric what semiotics was. Like I'm like, I don't even know. It's like a symbol or a sign. I don't know. I have no idea. But, um, but anyway, we've been trying to educate ourselves. And I think now we've seen a lot of art. We've had a lot of these conversations. So I think it would be great to, to meet with people and do a critique or something. We would love that. You know, it would be a fun experience. And I think it could be educational for us yeah, and for I the mean, artists. We'd love to see what new artists we're all about it. Yeah. Reach out. <laughs> yeah. We actually have um, our cards. Uh, if anybody wants it, we, we have little silly little business cards that have our, our handle on it. And um, it has our contact information. Um, and also, you can totally just, yeah, you can totally just reach out over Instagram as well. And there's a um, QR code on the back. But like, we would love that. That'd be amazing. So. Yeah. Anybody else? Any other questions? Yeah, yeah. No. Is there ever a price that's too high <laughs> for, a piece, for pieces that you really just love? Yeah. Um, we've like stretched like a couple of times, but usually, I mean, part, well, yeah. So part of being a collector, I think, is that you constantly, your budget constantly gets stretched and stretched. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, I don't know. And I'm like, oh, we're doing it. Yeah. And then, and then it's <laughs> the, to the next level. And it's like, I don't know. And it's like, oh my God, it's happening. Yeah. You know? So I think it's a great question. So yes, the answer would be yes. But that bar keeps getting higher and mm -hmm. higher and higher. I think the more obsessed we get, the more excited we get. Um, it, but not it, too high compared to like, I think a lot of 
Right. I, I think that we're not what, uh, auction houses. We don't anything. talk about prices a lot, but like the reason I showed like the five thousand dollar thing was like I feel like a lot of people think that the entry point to like contemporary art is like I don't know fifty thousand dollars or like a million dollars or something crazy. And certainly there are artists that sell for that, but there's a lot that don't, you know. Mm -hmm. And I think you can support and celebrate even artists in LA, New York, and that kind of thing for less money than you think. Mm -hmm. So, but watch out because it's gonna you you will keep bumping that budget up as you get excited about it. So it's a great question. But yeah, there still is a limit, unfortunately. But we're works working on, on great works on paper and prints and stuff, small yeah. edition prints. There's like a lot of ways to enter the art world besides large giant paintings. Yeah, oil on canvas. Yeah. But that, no, that's a great question. We're trying to get rid of that line. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Um, oh well, yeah, go ahead. So how do you determine like what is on display at your house if, if you have over yeah. 100 pieces. Uh, do you rotate them out, or how does that work? Well, we kind of have a big house. So, um, <laughs> luckily, we have a lot of wall space. We have some vaulted ceilings and a few rooms. So some of the art, yeah. maybe it's hung a little bit too high. high but, but no, I would say that like that's one of the benefits of living here in North Dakota is that we can have a little bit bigger house. Mm -hmm. We don't have a small apartment in New York or a little tiny home in LA or something. So luckily, right now, we live with all of our art. Mm -hmm. It is all hanging on the wall. So if you want to see every single one of these pieces, it is right down the street um, hanging up. So I think um, that's been, a but it's a great question because um, now that we've started collecting more, I think we really probably will start to kind of rotate things and I think try to hang them in a we way. Are, we're hitting our limit. Yeah, yeah. wall space. Mm -hmm. And so try to rotate them in a way that makes sense because I think we do see some collectors where they just put everything on the wall and it gets confusing and things don't really have the space to exist. So I think uh, you can kind of learn a bit of curatorial mm -hmm. sense, I guess, of editing and allowing things to have the space and looking for dialogue and then putting those together and having them up for a couple months and then taking them down. I'm very good at plastering walls now. Like <laughs> I can like take down everything, plaster it, paint it, put up a new thing. So bring it on. Like, uh, Greg, we're happy to help. <laughs> but um, but no, it, it's a great question because it's, it's something that we're starting to experience the more that we collect. So it's actually kind of the fun of collecting. Mm -hmm. Eric loves it. He's the interior design yeah. person. Yeah. So he comes up with the idea and he's like, let's do this. And I'm like, oh my God, like We're how is rehang this entire room? It's I'll like, come home know. from work and he's like, honey, I have a great idea. And I'm like, <laughs> oh my God, no. So, but yeah, it's, it's part of the fun. But part we did have fun. like a kind of a dark back part to our basement that, you know, we didn't know what we we're going to do with. And we're in the process of finishing that off and making like a whole gallery on the lower floor of the house. So yeah, we were gonna have exciting. a pool room and we're like, we don't really play pool, but we definitely collect yeah. art. So we're like putting up an art gallery in the basement um, that we can um, kind of have a more uh, a space to display mm -hmm. things because we're starting to collect more sculpture and it really needs space to exist. And that's a whole nother ball game. So, yes. Well, my question was um, similar to Rayson's, but it was about storage and archiving mm -hmm. your work. And I was wondering if you could speak a little bit to, you know, what are some of the struggles that you've had mm -hmm. with the actual, you know, the coldness, the dryness, uh, the changing of the seasons? Right. Like, what are some of the things that you've learned along the way that have helped you? Well, definitely to pay attention to the relative humidity in our house all the time. Yeah. Because the weather here is crazy. And um, we did have to rent a storage unit just for crates and stuff that things We have a in. storage unit full of crates. Yeah. Like there's no art in there, <laughs> it's just crates. Um, but yeah, I think um, as well as archiving, Eric has, so, you know, making sure that the humidity is well controlled in our home, you know, luckily our home is really well built, so it's it's kind of easier to control that and make sure that everything is safe and, and, sec and secured. Um, but also as far as archiving goes, Eric's done a really good job of yeah. Well, yeah, I keep all the databases and everything, but there's actually the um, new museum r created this site called Collectors, E-U-R-S, which is what's on our card. And it's a way to have like a virtual online museum. So we're able to upload images of everything. And then there's like, um, you know, information on there that's, it's public, but there's information that's only Private. accessible to us mm -hmm. where we can keep like, you know, just all the 
titles to the work and uh, you know history and, and prices and all that stuff. Yeah, and Collectors is a great um, a great uh, air, uh, site to discover new art. And um, there's a QR code on our card that if you scan it, it takes you to our Collectors website, which basically you can see essentially all the art in our collection. And that's a way to archive it for ourselves, but also to share it with others. So it's kind of both. And then in a really fun thing, Eric has a, a, a spreadsheet that we have, but we actually have little stories, like our collecting stories mm -hmm. of like, how we found this work, or this is how we connected to this gallery, or whatever. And so we're trying to kind of remember the special moments that we've had and the fun stories, and kind of Great record those. Exactly. Yeah. So um, we have a little uh, spreadsheet that is just for us, but it's right. it's fun. It's our, full our, of wonderful. Our art diary. Yeah, our art diary. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> All right. We'd we'd like to say thank you. Our time is up. Yeah. Unfortunately, I could listen for a long time. <laughs> thank you so much. Uh, the students are welcome to come get the card. If yes, you of course. Yes, uh -huh. Yeah, and we're happy to answer any questions or concerns. Like I said, please reach out over Instagram. Yeah. We'd love to say hi. Um, and if you if you'd like, we'd love to see your work and share and, mm -hmm. and go from there. Thank Thanks you, so Robin much, Dude. guys. It's Thanks. Wonderful. Okay. Bye, guys. <laughs> Thanks for watching.